Well, today I'm going to come to you from the book of John, chapter 15. Wow, what a surprise! <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> and as Dr. John was taking the offering, I was so happy to hear that he remembered what I preached last week. Hallelujah! <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And I, I think it's a timely message. But God's word is always timely, isn't it? It doesn't matter what's being preached. There's something there for us. And that's the important thing for us. And uh, we have our live streaming. I just want to let you know this. This week, we had a breakthrough. We have all of our current messages from October forward on our 24-7 streaming on our website. So it's all up there now. And that's a lot of messages, and that's wellspringlv.org, and you go to live streaming, we, uh, to media and then streaming. And uh, our morning services are streamed every morning, every Sunday morning live, and uh, so those are going out also to be seen. So if you know someone who can't be, they can always tune in on uh, the streaming uh, on our website. So, and then we took the older messages, that we had that were up on the 24/7 uh, streaming, and we moved them to you. We're moving them to YouTube right now. So Patty Richards is helping us with that. So that'll be on demand whenever you want to hear another message of the older messages. You can put them up there, and there are some messages in there from Pastor George, some of his good messages, and some of uh, his music. And so uh, check it out. You'll uh, you'll be blessed, and and I'm just blessed. We are. We are pressing forward. We are pressing forward. And if you, we do get a lot of people watching us as we're streaming and as we do our Facebook Live and from the house and from the other locations, uh, there are a lot of people that are watching and are being fed. And, and so it's all part of our ministry in this church, our, you and all of us. We're working together for this. And so we're thankful for it. I'm thankful for everyone that has helped. Praise God. So back to John, chapter 15. And uh, for now, this, not forever, but for now, this will probably be the, we'll move on from this topic. But I don't know about you, but it's been a rough part, a rough year so far. And when the Lord spoke to us early in the year, or to me, he said, there's going to be a lot of change, so you need to hold on to your hat. And I'm like, oh, okay, right? So I'm moving furniture. Oh my gosh. I mean, many of our lives have been turned totally upside down this year. And, uh, but God is in control, and he is taking care of us. And we are still here. Someone asked me, uh, in fact, <laughs> the president of our fellowship called me this week and asked how we were doing. And I said, well, we're going through hell, but we're going through. <laughs> he goes, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> That's an honest assessment, isn't it? Yeah, the devil has thrown up a lot of things in people's faces, and we're just not having it. And we believe in a God who will bring us through, and we will come through this with joy, unspeakable, and full of glory. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today again, because it's a, there's a real depth to these scriptures here in John 15. And the joy that Jesus gives to us, uh, we're his own people. We are of his own kind. And when he gives us his joy, he's giving us his joy. You know what I'm saying? His joy. Now, that's, that's different. His joy. We may think, well, he gave me his joy. It's like, well, he loaned me his car. That doesn't make it mine, right? He just loaned me the car. Well, he... He gave me the car. Well, but Jesus gave us his own joy to dwell in us. To me, there's, there's a great depth in that that we haven't, I haven't really thought about before. And in John 15, 11, he says that my joy might remain in you. My joy might, re my joy might remain in you. Now, a person cannot communicate to another person any joy except that 
which you have yourself and are conscious of yourself. And even then, it's difficult. Say, a rich man can tell you um, of joy of having riches, but he can't give that joy to a poor man. Because he has no concept of that. There's no way he could do that. A man who delights in foolishness, um, foolery, fooling around, joking all the time, can tell you the joy of nonsense, but he can't go beyond that. That's superficial. It's just there. So when Jesus gives us his joy, he gives us his own joy. And what is that? What is the joy of Jesus? What gave Jesus joy? What does the Bible say that he joyed over? Well, one thing was he had great joy in abiding in his Father's love. And he says that in these scriptures. Uh, he knows, Jesus knows, he knew, he knows, he will ever know that God loves him. And he never did not love him. Now think about our lives. This is true of us. Jesus the Bible says, has always loved us. Well, we were yet sinners. He still loved us. In fact, now that we are children of God, he doesn't love us any more than he loved us when we were sinners. Because God's love abides constant. Do you see what I'm saying? We have more access to his love now. We walk in the blessing of the covenant of Abraham. But his love to us is ongoing. And there was never a time he didn't love you. I know what flashes into your mind, your worst day in the world. When you did the worst thing ever possible. <laughs> Uh, and we could go through a list, right? <laughs> when you think about that, there was never a time that he didn't love you. Think about Jesus. God loved him in the manger. But he also loved him hanging on the cross. The joy that Christ gives to you is this kind of joy. The joy of knowing that the Father loves you. Look at uh, John 16, 27. John 16, 27. For the Father himself loveth you. You have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. The Father himself loveth you. Now, in most of our lives, love was conditional, even from our earthly fathers. Uh, if we please them, we talked about this last week, um, it was equated with love. If we displeased them, sometimes fathers would say, I hate you. I don't love you at all. Get out, thrown out, whatever, cast off. But God has never done that to his children. He's never done that. To know that, that God loves us. I want to tell you a personal story, and I, I've told this before, but I want to repeat it again. And my natural father was, was very ill before he died. Uh, he was in the hospital, and I had gone up there to take him some things and, and to be with him. And uh, my dad was very not, not real expressive um, to say, you know, um, that I love you or, or I mean, he would give you a little hug, but it was always kind of reserved. He was kind of a reserved person like that. He must have been maybe to say British. I don't know. But uh, in any event, he was kind of reserved. But uh, he, I can never remember him really saying to me, first, I love you. And so this, you know, when you're, he was almost 90 years old. So he lived a long time. And, uh, 
So I was leaving there, and so I would say to him, Dad, I love you. And he'd say, I love you too, sissy. And that would be our response. I'd always say, I love you first. I don't know if you've had that with parents, but he used to say, I love you because I love you. And he'd say, I love you too, sissy. And so uh, that day when I, when I left his room, that's what we said. And then I was going to be back the next day, and he didn't die that night. But don't worry about it. <laughs> it was, <laughs> that was a whole different story. But, so I was leaving the hospital, and I walked down. I'll never forget it. Walked down, ran for the elevator downstairs, going out to the front door. And when I got to the front door of the hospital, the Lord said to me, I love you too, sissy. And I went, melt down right in the middle of the lobby of the hospital. I, it was amazing to me. It just, I had never thought of it that way. But God does love us that much. He loves us as much as was never expressed to us by our natural parents. And the joy that I had over that was more than what, when my dad said, I said, I love you, and he said, I love you too, sissy. And, and I don't know why he called me sissy, but he did. And sometimes he would call me sissy. And uh, from a different age we were, right? He was from a different age. But when I got downstairs and God said that to me, and it was like booming in my whole person. It was like, I love you too, sissy. It was like, oh my gosh. I couldn't, it was just, I never thought of that. I'd never thought of that. But to think about the fact that God loves you, he loves you more than your natural parents, and he knows you so intimately that his love for you ever stays, it ever abides. I mean, I was crying, and I was laughing, and I was jumping, and I was skipping out to my car. It was so bizarre. People must have thought, what happened to her? Right? I didn't care. I mean, wow. It was just interesting because it filled me with delight that God would just call me sissy. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's such a, a personal thing. Uh, and I think for all of us, we need to recognize that God is our Heavenly Father. He has always been. We become His children when we receive him as Christ, but he has always loved us. He has always loved us. John 15, 15, 9 says to us, that's interesting, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. So when we say to someone that the Lord loves them, or when Someone says to you, well, you know that the Lord loves you. There's a depth to that that should give you great joy. And you say, oh, I know that. I thought I knew that too. I mean, I read it, but I didn't really know it until that night that when the Lord said that to me, it was like, you know, it's just some things the Lord speaks into your life and you just never forget it. You're like, changes the whole core of who you are. And that in itself prepared me for when he would go to be with the Lord, which wasn't far from then. But we are loved of the Lord. And it's an everlasting love. It's infinite. And he loves us as much as he loved Jesus. Wrap your brain around that. He loves us as much as he loved Jesus. There is such a liberation in the joy of being loved. Without reservation. I mean, lots of people will tell you that they love you in your life. But most of them want something from you. Or you're going to pay for it. But God loves you without reservation. He loves you on your worst day. And he loves you on your best day. He loved you when you were a notorious sinner, and he loves you now. When you're his child, the child of his bosom, the child of his heart. 
and the, the joy of, of uh, the Lord is like, um, what we say, uh, it's a holy, precious friendship. John 15, 14 through 15, he says, you are my friends. If you do whatever I command you. Henceforth, I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I've called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made, made unto you. He says, you've not chosen me, I have chosen you. You've not chosen me, I've chosen you. And some of you may have been born in a place where you thought from all the stories of the family that your birth was an accident. But God says your birth was never an accident. With him it was never an accident. Whatever it was a result of, he has always loved you. He's called us that to you. It's not an accident that you're here. You were never an accident. God has a plan for us. And this joy of the friendship that we can have with Jesus. This friendship isn't the one that's corrupted by familiarity where we become quite slovenly and, and like, oh, well, that's my friend, right? But no, it's not like that at all. It's precious. It's precious friendship. It's precious because uh, we've been taken by him into an intimate fellowship with himself. When he says, I've called you friends, it's a privilege to be called a friend of God. And in this hour, even in the churches, I see a lot of, what would you call liberty being taken? Well, God's my best friend, and so I can do whatever I want, and he understands. But no, that's not it at all. A precious friendship is one that you, you honor, that you river, that you um, are mindful of uh, and that you cultivate talk about bearing fruit cultivate a friendship you cultivate that friendship it's just like when when Jesus took John and let him lay upon his chest the Bible says that if you wanted to find John you found him hanging on Jesus just hanging on him laying up against him and it, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. John, of all the disciples, had a, a sense of the love that Jesus had for him. It went beyond just being friends or disciples. He understood that kind of love. And so he wasn't being, um, he wasn't being rude, but he was being, he just had this relationship with Jesus that it, it didn't matter. He was always there and he was just there. He was there at the cross when most of them ran. He was there when he took his mother, Mary, and he took care of her. He was there for the relational things of life, the hard things, like when you do die, or when you are horribly sick, and you can't even advocate for yourself. I mean, Jesus and John were so bound together in that. But that didn't mean that John didn't have a purpose. And it didn't mean that John wasn't going to be used by God. And it didn't mean that John was not going to suffer. You know, John was boiled in oil. He was boiled in oil. They tried to kill him, boiling him in oil, but it did not even burn his skin. Because God delivered him through it. He had a, a relationship with God. God didn't allow that to happen. And so to become a constant companion with the Lord is to walk and talk with him all the time, even in the midst of your daily work. We don't just have Jesus on Sunday, and Monday we go out and live like the devil. Uh, come back on Wednesday, repent. I remember I had some friends when I was younger, and I, I wasn't in church or church at all, and I remember that they would always go to, church and then they come out of church and they do whatever they wanted all week and then they run back to church and it's like why do you do that 
well, I have to get right with God. What if I die? Well, what if you died yesterday? You weren't so good yesterday. Uh, well, I didn't, so <laughs> this, yeah, this is kind of crazy thinking, isn't it? It's kind of crazy thinking. But he is our companion. And he has great joy to be the most friendly with his special people, and that's us. It gives him great joy for you to talk to him. And it should give you great joy to be able to talk to him. It's, it's uh, you sit with him. Uh, I mean, what higher joy is there than that? We can read his word. And you say, well, this is so odd. But it's not odd. It's the fact that joy is in the relationship. And Jesus has joy in you. And therefore, that joy comes is part of the joy he gives you. Now, uh, speaking of relationship, I remember growing up in in, um, in the church, I remember how certain people would tell me that they got a personal letter, letter from this great evangelist, whoever it was. You know, some, they send out letters of solicitation and, and that sort of thing. And there was, this, I got a special letter from uh, Billy Graham. I got a, whole, a personal letter from Billy Graham. And I'm like, what? You know Billy Graham? Well, no, but I got a personal letter from him. It was because they got a letter and it said, you know, here's so-and-so. You know what I was saying. And that's all well and good. Or we can be really impressed about getting invited to dinner with so-and-so or being invited here with so-and-so or personal phone calls. I will tell you, every day I get a personal phone call from the President of the United States. Do you? Or you get a text, well, you're just a better friend than me, right? And a text, that's more personal, right? <laughs> Have I ever met him? No. <laughs> Do I know him personally? No. Have I had a relationship with him? No. But, I mean, sometimes people just get all excited about that, and that's okay. But how much more should we be excited about the fact that we're friends with the Lord of Lords? The sir, the curios, the sir of God, the approachable, relationable sir of God. When we say Lord to Jesus, that's what we're saying, sir, Lord, the word is curios. That means when we say sir to Lord, we are serving him, sir, we're recognizing him. What, it says, what we're saying is, I'll do whatever you want, sir, I am at your disposal. Sir, I serve you. I only serve you. And so it's an interesting situation. And yet, here we have Jesus, and he's our personal friend. And we are going to go to a supper with him. We've been invited. In fact, it, we, we can't not go. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb. I mean, did he write us a letter? He wrote us a big letter. And so we did. It's a personal letter from God to us. This is more personal than anything I could get in the mail. This is personal from God. And so it's interesting. That gives me joy. I know in many nations there is no word. There's no Bible. It's not been translated into certain languages and things. And yet we have, we have so many of them. But it's joyful to read his word. It's not a have to, it's a get to. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Think about it. What are you going to wear? Will you have joy? I've never been one for big banquets and showy stuff like that. But I'm just thinking, wow, what are we going to wear? Why not the robe of righteousness that he gave to us? Amen. I mean, we're prepared. We're already ready. All he has to do is open the door. We're already dressed. We're already just like we need to be. And he doesn't call us servant. He calls us friends. Friends. The beloved of God. And a friend of the Son of God. Now, Jesus also had joy, constant joy, in glorifying his Father. And he had constant joy in glorifying his father because that's all he wanted to do was glorify his father constantly. 
He wanted to glorify his Father. Hebrew 12, 2 says to us, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. He saw beyond his circumstance. He saw beyond the problem. He saw beyond the murderous crowd. He saw beyond the unjust trial. He saw beyond the unjust verdict. He saw beyond all of that. It says, for the joy of obtaining the prize that was set before him, he endured the cross for us. He rolled away that great load of human sin off of all humanity that would take and receive it. He adequately, he adequately satisfied the claims of divine justice. And he magnified the law and made it honorable. The law was made honorable, yes. He gave us a new heart that we might keep it. Didn't he say that? It's written on our hearts. We can keep it. It's not a hard thing because it's us. Because we're in him. And he was the fulfillment of God's plan for mankind. That was his joy. He gives us that kind of joy in us. He gives us that kind of joy. He endured the cross that we might be with him and be his friends. Yeah. Sometimes we think of the law as being so stringent and still so over there. But the law is not still so over there because it's all yea and amen in Christ Jesus. It's the law of love. The law of love for God and the law of love for me. He finished the work that his father gave him to do and he was joyful. Should we not also rejoice in his finished work? That should be enough for us every day. I mean, for heaven's sakes, we were saved. I mean, no matter what's going on around us, we've all been through some stuff. He finished the work. He finished the work. He didn't draw back. He finished the work because of love, because he loved us. You do not have to make one stitch in the robes of righteousness that you're wearing. You didn't have to sew it. You didn't have to provide the fabric. In fact, it's woven out of one whole piece. Very expensive. Just like Jesus' robe was that he wore on this earth. Perfect in every respect. No stains. And you didn't contribute one penny, not one penny, to the price for your redemption. Did you? Not one penny. I thought it would be great to have a handful of pennies to just throw them on the floor. Kind of an extravagant thought, but, uh, but think about that. Not one penny. It's finished. It's not wanting anything. Jesus did it all for us. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end in the Greek. He is the Eleph and Paul, the beginning and the end in Hebrew. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. If we just think about that, we can have a feast just thinking on it. Before anything was, he was. And he still is. And we are his. And we are in him. Can you see what he has done? He put his foot on the dragon's neck. He put death and hell beneath his feet. And the glory, the glory, the Shekinah glory, 
crowns his whole head as he waits for the whole creation to bow before him as king. It's finished. It's all done already. He finished it. He left nothing undone. And he did it for you and for me. He did it for us. Joy. 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 I mean, it's, I mean, can you think about it? Joy. And you weren't even alive yet then. You weren't even, we, we hear we weren't even born when Jesus finished that work. But he finished it for us. He finished it for all who would believe upon him. In John 15, 11, he says, These things I have spoken to you that my joy, my joy might remain in you. <laughs> I love that. Now that I've learned about it, and that your joy might be full. His joy is remaining in us, and his joy is full. Well, think about that. There's no other joy in nature that remains if we have God's joy. Oh, the people can have, have joy when a baby is born. But then, if the baby dies, the joy goes away, doesn't it? Farmers have joy at harvest. When there's a great harvest, there's great joy and dancing. And But then comes the winter. And the harvest gets eaten up. Dreary and cold. And where was the joy in the dancing, right? But when God gives us his joy, it remains because the cause remains. It's not seasonal. The cause remains. Hebrews 13, 8 says, He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will never change. He has never changed. He is the same. The cause is the same. Jesus, crucified, buried, and risen for us, redeeming us from all of the corruption because of the fall. His love never changes towards his people. Such joy to walk out of here today and know that, hey, God loves me. That makes me feel joyful. And I don't know, maybe you're still making me feel like dancing, brother. Amen. That makes me feel like running around. Yeah, it makes me feel like crying. It makes me feel like singing. It makes me feel great to know that Jesus loves me. <laughs> I love you. Absolutely. His love, his love never changed. And the atonement is eternally effective. The Lord Jesus never ceases his intercession for us. He doesn't go to bed at night and not pray for you in the midnight hour when you can't sleep and you're in trouble. He's always praying for us. That's Hebrews 7.25. His acceptableness before God on behalf of us never varies. It doesn't change. The promises of God, read them in your Bible. They don't change. His covenant, his covenant never You don't have to worry about the fine print, which you might not have read so carefully. His covenant never changes. It's always the same. If you rejoice with his joy today, you can rejoice with his joy tomorrow. If you rejoice with his joy today, you will have his joy eternally. Forever. It's not, it remains. It doesn't go away. Christ remains. He stays with us. We are in him. He is in us. His joy remains. And his joy is full. Full. Fullness of joy. I don't know. We've kind of had popcorn joy in our lives, probably. 
joy is this, and joy is that. So it's kind of joy, 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 joy. But Jesus' joy is full. It's when there's no room for any more joy, that's how much joy you have with Jesus. You have all the joy. I mean, just to be touched by that joy one time, you can walk in that joy all the time. If you've ever felt that joy of Jesus in your life. And whether you've felt it or not, the Bible says you got it. So if you're depressed or you're oppressed or you're physically down, God still has given us his joy. Does that make us joyful in our tribulation? Well, in a way it can. We're not joyful for the tribulation, but I'm going through. I don't know about you all. I'm going through. <laughs> I got joy because there's a light at the end of that tunnel, my golly, and I'm going to see it, right? Amen. I'm going through. You are going through. And when you have that much joy, there's no room for sorrow. If you're full of joy, how can you be sorry? There's no room for sorrow. If you're full, if you have a glass up here and it's full, can you put coffee in that water glass? A glass full of water, can you add coffee to that water glass? Can you add tea, soda pop? It's full already, right? It's full already. You can't put anything even of another kind in it because it's full. So to know the love of God towards us gives us joy. Tremendous joy. And there's no room for anything else. And you find it bubbling up in your life. You least expect it. You least expect it. Because that joy just kind of glazes over and puts everything else like, I don't know, it kind of disappears with the joy of Jesus in our life. There was a song we used to sing. It was, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Sing with me. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of this world will grow strangely dim. And the light of his glory and grace. Isn't that awesome? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. When you are so full, you don't want any more. Have you ever eaten to where you're so full you can't even have dessert? <laughs> I mean, seriously, that's being full, isn't it? You just don't want any more. And the world's charms, it, they lose all of their invitation to us. Amb ambition, competition ceases. Uh, lust. Lust is quiet. Covetousness is dead. Desires to go running about and have fun, somehow you're more happy to stay at home. It's very interesting the way the things of the world grow strangely dim when Jesus is on the scene. Jesus is all I need. He's all you need too. And that gives me great joy. It's much less complicated. And he gives me everything I need. And I think the greatest thing is that if we're full of joy, then that's how there's no sorrow in us. There's a spirit of joy. The Holy Ghost dwells in us. And so as we close this, I want us to have communion with this joy that Jesus is bringing to us. And uh, as we do, we are going to 
I can't explain it. His stuff infuses with joy. I feel that in my in my heart and in my spirit. So uh, Dr. John Ogle would come and pass the communion today. And I'm going to kind of talk while you do that. Um, people full of joy don't usually talk a lot. Because if you're full of joy, it's hard to explain it to someone. A person who carries a glass that's full to the brim does not go dancing and jumping around because you'll spill the glass, right? If you're full of joy, don't spill the cups, really. Okay. If you're full of joy, it's like a river. It carries you along. When you're full of joy, you it's hard to explain it to somebody. Um, they might think you're smirking, but actually you're just full of joy. No smirking about it. It's just smiling. It just kind of shows on the outside when we're full of joy. And this joy and the love of God together will lift us above the circumstances that we're going through. And really, one look is not enough. One look is not enough when you're looking at Jesus. It's not enough. We want to look more. We want to see him more. We want a better, a better angle, right? Do you know that the angels in heaven watch the redeemed of the Lord on the earth? And they cannot understand what has happened to them. Because they have never been redeemed. They have never been rescued out of the clutches of the devil. They've always lived, in, those that are in heaven, they have lived there with God. They don't know our joy at being, being redeemed by grace and by dying love that he would give his life for us. This joy, it's hard to understand it. As we come to this table today, may the master, the sir, the curios, the Lord of our lives smile upon us and make us to be a permanent branch in the body. Amen? Carrying everything, all the nutrients that the vine has goes through our lives. And that his joy, his great joy comes to us as naturally as that. We are part of him. And he says that our joy will be full. And it will remain. So I don't know where you are today in your mental status, whether you're depressed or sad or struggling. We all have stuff because stuff just seems to happen in this world. But you have to remember more than stuff. you got joy. And we've got Jesus. And we're not being left to the stuff. No. We're precious in his sight. He joys over us. He sings over us. That's how, how he, he looks at you. Just picture the Lord singing over you with joy. Oh, that's awesome. Our joy is full. This table is for the redeemed only. And we are the redeemed. In fact, the scripture says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We are redeemed, aren't we? His body that was broken for us. Don't take it lightly. His body that was broken for us. But he did it with joy. The joy that was set before him. The lashes upon his back. He took them that we might be healed. And we are healed. And we are receiving healing. Forgiveness. That joy abides. It remains. Let us eat together. We receive healing, Lord. 
we receive healing. In our lives. And his blood that was shed for us for the remission of our sin. Go and sin no more. That means we never miss the mark again. Because we're in Christ. Forgiveness of sin. We are free and clear of the past. Let us drink together. And let's just thank him. Thank you, Lord. Be joyful that he did all this for us because of love. And we are loved. And we will always be loved. And he never changes. Glory to God. We give you the praise, Lord. Thank you that we're part of the family. We treasure each one. Each one in this building, each person, we 